welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. Today on the show, we're going to have an interesting change of pace. I have a guest today, but the guest is interviewing me, and I'll just give you a tiny bit of context before I introduce him. Uh, this guy, his name is Matt Blasdell. He is a buddy of mine from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I've known him for, gosh, what is it, like eight years? nine years now, and he's, he's a very philosophical guy, successful, runs a successful business, and the other day we were in class, and he had just beaten me in jiu-jitsu, as he's prone to do, and he uh, he started asking me some really interesting questions about human flourishing, and I thought, oh, well, you should ask these on the, on the, the podcast, and so then he sent me a, a list of really interesting questions, and I thought we would just start to go through them. But before we start on those questions, I want to introduce him. Uh, hey, Matt, welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. Great being here, Alex. Thanks, man. Okay, now I think uh, bef- when we were doing uh, when we were talking before the show, you mentioned that um, you had some memory of how we met. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious what that was. Yeah, it's funny. It wasn't the exact first time we met. I think we'd rolled a couple times before we actually. So exchanged rolled words. for the audience means to yeah, basically to wrestle, spar, and jujitsu. Yeah, on rolling around on the ground with uh, with the classical Japanese kimono or the gi as we call it in Brazilian jujitsu. Yeah. We rolled a couple times, and um, I had noticed something different about you, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. And one day, killing five minutes or so before class, uh, maybe just two or three months into training with you, I think I asked what you did. And I, I believe your words were, um, I work for a think tank, and I had never heard of anybody who had done that before. And I could tell that my face had done something uh, to pique your interest because you looked at me squarely and said, what did you think I worked in construction or something? <laughs> which I, I did I really say you that? Did, which, which I just thought was so ironic because I, I am actually myself in construction, not not so much with hammers and nails, but uh, demand creation for a construction related product. So I I just always thought that that was the most delightful way to start a relationship. <laughs> well, but also you you're in a field. I mean, if I remember because I remember a conversation we had about what what you did because you were talking about. I mean, you're. How would you describe the industry that you're in? Yeah, at construction in the, the largest umbrella, but uh, we, we create demand for high-performance plastic sheet goods that go underneath concrete, keeping moisture, termites, and brownfield gases out of buildings. Right, and, I remember, and so at the time, I was already very interested in petroleum. So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, plastics, that mm-hmm. piqued my interest. And I remember you were just telling me, like, water is... Water is the problem. Water is very much the issue, yeah. M- most time people think about liquid water, they, they don't think as much about vapor, and that's the primary purpose for our plastic. Wait, explain that. So, yeah, just like on a, a warm day with a, a glass outside with ice in it, you get dew point on the glass, and that exact same thing occurs directly below floor coverings, unless you're interrupting the natural process of water coming from the clouds, rain down into the water table, it evaporating, moving through the soil. When we cap that off with something like a concrete slab, moisture still moves right through it until it reaches something impermeable. That's typically a floor covering. So you can end up with dew points, moisture issues, all sorts of things underneath floors, causing problems and wreaking havoc in the building. All right. So I, I don't know if the whole audience is interested in that, but I, I'm it. interested in these kinds of things. If, if they want to know more about this, if they have this problem, <laughs> what's the company? Just so we... Stego Industries. Yeah. S-T-E-G-O. Like a stegosaurus. You got it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, let's start. So what did, what did you want to ask me? Oh, it, it was really on the topic of clarity. Um, you know, I, I've been trained with you for so long and, you know, I can typically get a sense for what someone is thinking and you know in the mode that i'm in of you know trying to be the best parent i can trying to to lead my company trying to do good work in the community i'm just becoming more and more curious about uh, what people see that i might be missing and you know you being the type of guy that you are uh, i wanted to ask you what clarity you had that you felt like other people might be missing that they would really benefit from having yeah, and so this this just for full disclosure, this is the question or a variant of the question Matt asked me that I said, oh, we should talk about this because I, I had an answer and I think I recorded the answer, but then I for myself, but it wasn't wasn't like in a in a format that would be very pleasant to listen to. So I mean, I mentioned this to you at the time. You know, there's this there's a Peter Thiel question, and I don't remember exactly what it is, but he'll he'll ask prospective entrepreneurs, you know, something like, what do you know, like or what. The way I think of it is like, what are, you know, what are you, 
write about that most people don't believe mm. or something like that. And so uh, the answer I gave you off the top of my head last week is still pretty much my my answer. So I'll just uh, share it with people and then we can talk more about it. And I, I, gave, I gave three interrelated ideas. And so one of the ideas is that people are much more open to reason than is commonly believed. So it's usually believed that you can't actually persuade people with reason or logic or anything like that. And I, I believe that it's actually possible to do much more than people think. And then that relates to the second thing, which is that a much clearer level of explanation is possible in the world. We tend to think just, you know, we're taught something. And so Matt and I will think about jujitsu, but you even think about, okay, the way physics is taught, the way I remember in philosophy class, the way philosophy is taught. And for whatever reason, I've had the idea that there's a much clearer way of explaining things. Like if we were to go 500 years in the future, someone will have figured out a way clearer way of, of explaining these things. And I found that to be a very useful uh, premise, which I can get into more. And then the third premise, so there's people are more open. So you can think of it this way. People are more open to clear logical explanations than than is commonly thought. And then two is there's a much higher level of clear logical explanation than people think. And then the final one is that there's a much higher level of clear thinking than people are aware of, particularly in the realm of human action. So there's there's always a danger in life of just of not realizing that we live in a point in human evolution, including intellectual evolution, and to treat the best now as corresponding very strongly to the best that's possible. And I believe that particularly in the realm of human action, we're nowhere near the best that's possible, and we're not anywhere near in terms of our clarity of thought, uh, particularly about human action and our clarity of explanation, and that if and I, but I believe that if I think clearly about something and I can explain it uh, clearly, then that will persuade a lot more people of the truth and benefit them. So, for example, in my work in energy, that's what I'm thinking about all the time. I'm working on a new version of the book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and I spend what most people would consider like an inhuman amount of time working on my own thinking. That's most of what I'm doing is, is and trying to find people who can help me and who can challenge me. And that's, that's where the action is for me. And I would contrast it with some other people and their strengths and weaknesses to every approach. But other people are, you know, for them, they think the leverage is they just like, if I'm on TV 20 hours a day and talking to people, then then that's important in a sense. Yeah, you can make an impact. And if I'm just sitting in a room all the time, all the time, then I'm never going to make any impact. So I I need to make sure I don't just sit in the room. But the reason I do sit in that room and go through a lot of effort is because I do believe that a higher level of clarity is possible. And if I can get that internally, then I can share that in my explanations. And that's going to make people's lives a lot better. And then if I can really do that well in one field, then I can inspire to do, people to do that. Uh, in other fields, and then I will be able to learn from much better explanations and much clearer thinking in other fields. Yeah, it's uh, so many things I want to hit there. So the whole description that you just gave talks about kind of like your own thoughts and your own perceptions, and then almost uh, working it into your ability to communicate it to other people. That mm -hmm. when you go through that process, uh, that, that one very big process, what smaller processes do you see that allow you to do those things? Well, I mean, I, I think of something like jujitsu and if I'm going to teach a certain move, I spend time on the move. And then typically it's not until I'm in front of the, the people who I'm teaching where based on what I know, they know, I'm then tailoring it to try and, you know, capture something that I think is going to be sticky to them. How, how do you go through that process when you, you do or don't know who you're talking to? So let's pick a pick a just a subject so I can think about it because in a sense the question is like how do you think oh, right no, for sure. and yeah, how do you yeah, explain yeah, let, let's start with fossil fuels and okay yeah yeah, yeah. that uh, well so there's there's the element of how do I think it through for myself and then there's given a certain level of understanding or at least I think I have a certain level of understanding how do I communicate it to others and I, I should warn in advance there's a danger. I think there's always a danger if one has success with something of just assuming that 
I understand my own success fully and I can just tell it to others. And you see this with a lot of the success literature and audio and stuff. You'll see someone who's a successful businessman and then somebody asks, asks them, oh, what are your secrets to being a successful businessman? And then they'll say like X, Y, and Z. But if you were to actually look at the anatomy of the system that just all the, all the functioning internally that had made them successful, maybe those three things or five things just would not even be very useful to somebody else. So it's, I try to be aware of what, what, do, like how much of what I've been successful with is transferable. That's even a question, but then certainly how much of it do I, do I know? So what I can say for sure is that I think one thing I started off with, but that I know can be fine tuned and maybe this won't seem very useful but is that I think I have a good sense of when thinking is clear, like when something is clear to me, when something has been explained, you know, when, when somebody is explaining it clearly to me and, and I'll give it, and I remember this actually, you can learn this both from subjects that you're good at and for subjects that you're bad at. So with philosophy, which is something I've been good at, is I could see, oh, this person could explain this idea and the same idea somebody else gave a bad explanation. And I would just I would just file that. But also with things I had more difficulty with, like computer science, I would notice, oh, you know, this teacher is explaining it and I think I'm dumb because I don't understand, but this other person explained it more clearly. And and you developing a very high degree of sensitivity to clear thought and clear explanation, because then once you get that, then it develops an attraction to the clearer thinkers. And what happens is the more that I follow clear thinkers and interact with them, the more that I can pick up a lot of the nuances of what they do. It's, it's I can study their explicit method so I can have them tell me, oh, go through step one, go through step three. But, but I can also, I almost like internalize them because I'm around them. Uh, so much. So there's this this guy that I used to work with at the Ayn Rand Institute, this guy, Ankar Gatte, and he was just really brilliant and and definitely the clearest thinker out of out of all of us by by a margin. And I would remember, you know, it would just be noticeable listening to him answer questions versus other people answer questions. And one thing I would do is particularly when it was something about, say, objectivist philosophy, which I know a lot about, not as much as he does, but if he would answer a question, I'd I'd think why does he answer this? How would I answer it? Like I would kind of answer the question in my mind first and then listen to his answer and then look at, at the difference. So one, one thing that I'm sure of is that if you develop a sensitivity for this feels clear, this doesn't feel clear, and you just pursue that maniacally, you are going to inevitably pick up a ton of stuff. So that's, that's one thing I'd say just as a, as a general guideline. And then on top of that, the more you ask why questions, the better off you are. So you ask, why is this explanation better? You know, then you can get a lot there. And just one thing I would say, and I've, I've talked about this on some of the, the podcasts, but I'd refer people because not everyone has listened to all of the episodes. I think particularly episode four, where I talk about explanation systems, and then I think six or so I talk about conversation. You'll hear me talk a lot about what I call context bridging, which is that I, I think of Every I think of a context as the sum of what you know or think you know, some of what you know and and think you know I should say, and I and you can think of that as, you know, if I'm trying to explain something to Matt, his context is context A, and then my context is context B, like point A and point B, and then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add certain pieces of knowledge to his context, or I'm trying to subtract certain things. Or I'm trying to modify certain things that are sort of half true. Um, so you know, in, in the whole realm of of um, like, let's say fossil fuels, there's something like I put in the half true thing. Somebody will say something like climate change is real, and I'll say like, okay, there's something there, mm -hmm. but but if you think about it that way, it's not going to be very helpful because the real question is what's the best course of action for human flourishing, and so what you what what climate change is real is trying to get at is CO2 has a certain amount of warming influence on climate. And so, but if you think of it in the way I just said, that's going to help you put together the puzzle of, okay, how good are fossil fuels or not? Uh, versus if you just say climate change is real or not, and that's all that matters, 
then you might say, oh, climate change is real, therefore we shouldn't use fossil fuels, and then you'd do something uh, really bad, which unfortunately a lot of people are are headed in that direction. So my, my model of add, subtract, modify, I find that to be very helpful and just when I'm dealing with an audience, thinking about where are they, what do I need to add, what do I need to subtract, and what do I need to modify to for them to understand a certain point. What level of add, subtract, modify is necessary for you to gain comfort that you need to, to do this communication that you're talking about? You mean with somebody else? Well, yeah, it's just, is there a matter of, of time at which you know that you've arrived at enough clarity for it to be a truth or helpful, or is it a degree of profundity that is necessary? How, how much time do you spend on add, subtract? Well, so, so I think of the add, subtract, modify as primarily um, delivering something that I know. So it's, it's okay. I have the context already. So if the issue of fossil fuels is like, there's a question of, what should be the continuing role of fossil fuels or not in our civilization. I feel like, okay, I've worked that out. And I think that overall global human flourishing requires more fossil fuel use over the next several decades, not less. So like I've, let's say I've concluded that add, subtract, modify is I'm primarily thinking of, okay, now that I know that, where is the audience? And then where do I, where I want them to be? And part of what I have to do is I have to decide, um, how how big a chunk do I want to bite off? Because if I want to convince them of that whole idea that the continuing use of fossil fuels is uh, indispensable to human flourishing, that might take a whole book, mm -hmm. right? Or I might, sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'm not going to fully explain it, but I'll just give you an indication and maybe I could explain it in two minutes. So you're always, there's the question of how much context you want to build, mm -hmm. or I sometimes call it bridge. And so that has to do with the complexity of the point in relation to their starting point. That's, and that's that's a lot of it. Makes perfect sense. It's so interesting. What what other tidbits do you have in there for for folks who are looking to do that themselves in their own field? Oh man. It's so one thing is that it's just there are certain things where people will say to you in in business. They'll say, do not start your own business or something like that. They'll just say, because it's just so hard, particularly that, that people are starting things like Apple and Facebook and, and, and not that that's any kind of common thing, but just when somebody says, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, often the best entrepreneurs will say, like, you, do you really want to do this? Because there's a lot involved in this. And the way I feel about at least the level at which I'm trying to clarify my own thinking and other people's thinking, I would say that so much of it is just that motivation, is that internal motivation of I want to be clear for myself and then I care about clarity for others. And that's, obsession is is not quite the right word because it, it probably is too negative, but it's just that feeling of, I don't understand this. I want to understand it better. And it's just, that's always going on. It's always going on. And that it's just, if, if you're in the realm of, of, of teaching people things, I think you should always be thinking of not, not should as, but it's just this, this will show that this is your inclination. You'll be thinking a lot about how could I have explained that better? Oh, this person has a better way of explaining it. Oh, this person has a better way of explaining it. And for, if, if somebody doesn't have that motivation, it might be an indication that maybe they shouldn't be teaching or maybe they should they don't want to do um, kind of intellectual work in the sense of, of thinking about different kinds of ideas because it just it just takes so much work to get to a certain level. And, and hopefully people can find something in, li in life where they're just inclined to think about it so that because it, it can't be that your job, or one of these pursuits is just constant willpower as in, Oh, I just got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this. And it's got to be a lot of it has to be an internal motivation. And then there are points where I'll push myself. So I'll give an example with, I was working on the outline of my book and I have a couple of really good advisors right now. And I promised somebody, okay, you review my outline and I'm going to give you two days notice. So he had given me really good feedback the last time and I felt like, okay, I got so much to do. And I was super motivated. And then there was this point last Tuesday 
and I I needed to f- I needed to send him something by the end of Tuesday, and so I went to a sushi restaurant and kind of blasted out the last two hours and fifteen minutes. You know, I just kind of thought, okay, well, eat some sushi, and uh, kind of add a little bit of pleasure because I'm having a little bit of tr- just to push myself over the edge. But if I needed sushi all the time to do clear thinking, then it would be a mess. Mm-hmm. So that, whether that's a very transferable example or not, I think everyone can benefit. So part of Human Flourishing Project and all of these principles is everybody can benefit from these things, these concepts like context, bridging, add, subtract, modify. But, you know, you know, Matt, somebody who's it's obviously very interested in doing it with jujitsu and probably with other things, it just it's it's good to know, it's useful to just know that with anything, if you really want to master it, it, it should be that that you have that internal desire to master it. And, and that the amount of effort that you'll put in that won't feel like work to you, that'll just feel like this is what I want to do. That's so staggering that anyone for whom they don't have that internal drive, it will seem absolutely insane. So I I think that my life should be absolutely insane to most people. But for me, it's mostly, oh yeah, well, I like thinking about this, but can you imagine, can you imagine spending months thinking about the outline of a book, not even writing about it, but like the outline of it. And maybe you spend a month and go the wrong way. And all you have to show for it is nine points on a piece of, on a computer screen. And for me, it's like, oh, well, I, I switched three of the words. That was a huge breakthrough. Mm-hmm. And most people think, well, that's nothing. Hmm. No, that's great, man. I, I was curious about whether or not my suspicion for where your answers would go would be anywhere close. And I was correct in that I, I had no idea. So that's Okay. It's good stuff. No, I did a lot of valuable stuff in there, man. I, as I was thinking about this, the, the other, you know, somewhat similar question that I was able to populate that I was really curious about your answer on was this piece about, uh, the appropriate amount of adversity for mankind. What, what do you think is the appropriate amount of adversity for mankind? Yeah. So I like this, this question, although it's not quite how I think about it. So I think of, cause if you ask me how much adversity would I like, like, would I like more than I've had? No, no, I would not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that indicates then would I like less? Yes. In a, in a certain sense, I I mean, let's put it what I do like that is related to adversity, which is I do like challenge. So there's something, there's something fundamental, um, um, you know, about challenge as it relates to life. And it probably has to do something with the issue of growth and capability. And there's a there's a book by a guy I'm a big fan of named Dan Sullivan. I, I've talked about him a bunch on these podcasts. He started a company called Strategic Coach, and he has a lot of good frameworks for thinking about things. And he has a book, a little book called Capabilism. And he ties a lot of human motivation to the desire to amplify capability. And I that resonates a lot with me. And you think about like what we do in jujitsu and why, why are we doing this? Is mm-hmm. it, right. I mean, is it, is it really that we're just going to be that much prepared, more prepared for a street fight that we're in? Right? It doesn't make any sense in terms of, but there's something about, Oh, I learned how to do this. And I learned, I, I learned this skill and then I want to learn more and I want to get better and I want to get better. And that's something where is that, ad, I mean, I would like to think, now, certain parts of that I experience as adversity. So that's a good example, actually, because it's it's on my mind. And in fact, at the moment, uh, I would experience it as adversity in the sense of um, I haven't been as motivated to do it lately. And so that's, in, and in particular, that will often happen if I'm not doing it as much. And then I'll sort of lose the momentum and then I'll just go in and get like kind of blitzed by people or at least not feel good myself and then be like why why am I doing this like I just go into the ocean that sounds like more fun or I'm gonna go ride my one wheel or something like that and um but then you know when I'm in there are other times when I'm in it and it's just oh this is this is great I mean this is just so satisfying to do this and develop these capabilities and to get better and get to interact with people in an interesting interesting way but I think of it as I don't think of it as oh I need the adversity, um, except that, I mean, the adversity is a means to the growth in the capability. And so one thing is, if we think about context bridging, just in terms of our knowledge, one thing that's important is we start off 
as human beings, knowing knowing nothing. And we don't really have much in terms of instincts, you know, compared to other animals, and they can't do all the things we want to do. So we have to learn all of these things. And so I think, okay, well, let's say in jujitsu, maybe I'm experiencing adversity because I have some, maybe I'm, maybe sometimes I create unrealistic expectations for myself. Like I think, oh, if I don't train for a week, then I should be better than the people who've been training, right? But then that's, that's some, so one way to think of that is, oh, that's something that's wrong with me. But you can also think of it, that's something that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's an obvious thing to know how to manage one's own expectations. So then the adversity um, is, is a means to it. So what I'd say is, is if I could choose, I would choose a life full of challenge, but experienced as little as possible as uh, adversity and in part because a lot of what you know a lot of what's experienced as adversity is real adversity mm-hmm. it is is negative stuff and you can't say oh, well I want a life where nothing negative comes up but you just think about situations when I have friends who you know parents have died at a young age I mean that's huge adversity and I'm really glad I did not have that and I admire people for getting through it but I would still much rather, just I would experience life as challenge and growth. And what I think of, I'm I'm not a parent yet, but I think of, um, you know, in terms of what I would want for my kids as a parent is, yeah, I would want them to experience life f- full of challenges. And I would want to teach them how to handle adversity, but I wouldn't think, oh God, I, I want my kid going through adversity every two days. Like, oh, that's going to be great, right? Because mm-hmm. the ultimate adversity is getting killed. Mm-hmm. So I don't want that. And then also, you know, having like severe trauma, physical or mental, like that's another, right? Like getting raped is it? there's all these horrible things like losing limbs and getting traumatized in different ways and getting kidnapped, right? So there's, there's something, what we really want is, is the, is the growth. Um, So I'd, I'd say how to handle adversity, but, but mostly as, I do want that challenge and the capability growth. And when people lack that, then life is just very boring. I haven't seen many exceptions to that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting too. So that, uh, you know, full disclosure on the, uh, the genesis of the question, if, if I were to answer the first question about clarity, my answer would be somewhere in this realm of adversity. I, I think one of the reasons why I've loved jujitsu so much is because it's given me some clarity on this specific issue. You know, when I came out of college, uh, you know, I saw my career mostly as a means to kind of transcend hard stuff to arrive at a place where I was done doing hard stuff. Mm. And as I grew, um, you know, I, I had a slightly different ambition and jujitsu really kind of showed a path on that, that created clarity around kind of a specific idea around adversity. And it's, it's something that I've kind of dubbed adventure. And I almost, you know, with training and economics, I kind of put it on a graph and say, you know, on one axis, you have a skill on the other axis, you have, you know, challenges. And if your challenges are far greater than your skills, you're going to be stressed out. It's hard to be thriving when you're stressed out. If your skills are far greater than your challenges, you're going to be bored. It's hard to be thriving when you're bored, but where these two things intersect, yes, that's adversity, but it's the thriving variety of it where you're feeling validated about the stuff that you have. And what I've you know, come to in the last several years is trying to, you know, craft my life in a way where I'm continually, you know, working back into that spot. If it's a little bit bored, it's taking on new challenges. If, um, you know, things are just too much, you know, either, you know, working to reduce that in some way, or if I can't, you know, growing my skills that all of a sudden now the challenge is an actual blessing. But what I found over time is that the, the more time that I spend in that intersecting time, I grow really fast and new challenges all of a sudden are not this thing that are the bane of your existence. It's actually a necessary component of thriving because without them, you, you start to get bored. So yeah, based on hearing that, like what other context do you have? Does that generate anything else in your, your well, plan? I just, um, people have listened to episode one and particularly episode two, because then I, at the end of episode one, I believe I talk about, I, I ask people, what are the words that you would associate with flourishing and then i give my words in an episode two so i think i asked people to do seven and i i think i gave i cheated and gave eight mm-hmm. myself but you it's interesting to think about 
what is the role of, say, challenge in that. But I really like putting it in the context of, of flourishing because then I think about, it helps me distinguish between types that I like and types that I, I don't like. And, and one thing that doing this podcast has helped me with a lot is just having an, a more and more refined feel for what I like, how I like my life to be and how I don't like it to be. And one thing I've just become even more sensitive to is how I do not like constant pressure in my life. I don't have, I don't like this feeling of, oh, I got to do this, this minute and this, this minute, any kind of, of overwhelm. So I like challenge, but I like challenge in a, in a kind of relaxed way where I can just, okay, let's, let's, so it'd be like, okay, we have, we have five hours to figure out something and we're pretty con and it's hard. But we're pretty confident we could figure it out in two hours. Like that's a pretty nice relaxed and maybe you want to give yourself three hours, but if you give yourself 30 minutes, yeah, that can be kind of a fun thing. But if you felt like, Oh, I'm going to die if I don't get it in 30 minutes, that's not that much. That's not that much fun. So I, I there is, there is a way of ex, experience challenge, experiencing challenges and growth that is, that is, most of the time enjoyable. And I think that's one of, that's one of the tests and one of the, so, so I just, one thing I stress in this program is just the, the experience of your life matters a lot. I mean, in a sense that's, that is your life. So you really have to think about, am I experiencing it in this way, this in a way that I like? And if I think something is good for me, like challenge, is this in some way contributing to me experience, experiencing my life in an enjoyable way? Because if it's not, then I'm quite uh, suspicious of it. Interesting. Uh, I, I'm enjoying this. I don't know if you're having fun. I'm yeah, yeah, awesome no, time. it's it's. <laughs> I I I did not expect most of the answers that I've given. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, keep it moving then, man. Uh, yeah. The uh, the next thing that I thought to ask um, was you know more a matter of, of personal curiosity and uh, hearing your take on it. You know, what do you perceive as the appropriate amount of having? You know, there's a bunch of different things to have, whether it's, you know, things, luxury, relationships, whatever else. But uh, what what does that stir in you? Well, so give me give me some extremes or give well, me. I mean, we're, we're in Orange County, right? I mean, we're we're in Laguna Beach. And so you know, we, we have <laughs> we we have I mean, virtually any relativity that's out there. We we have. So, you know, as you've explored human flourishing and you know, scarcity of resources and been in that world, you know, I, I was uh -huh. just curious to see what you, well, so I don't, I don't feel like I have too much. So maybe that, that shows where I am. I mean, here's, here's an interesting perspective on this. Interesting as in, I'm just thinking of it, but it seems relevant is that, you know, in, in economics, you often, in, in life, you talk about products and services and there's a new movement there's a new industry called mobility as a service, which is what Uber sells, right? I mean, instead of selling you a car, they sell you mobility. And I am a, probably in the top 0.1% of users of this service because I do not drive. And I mostly ride Uber, have my assistant Kelso drive me around, and, and this is great. And what this points to is that ultimately all products are services because ultimately when you have something you're you're just having an ex it's it's it gives you a set of experiences in certain moments of time and that's it right so if you buy a car then that car in a in a real sense is the experiences that you have with the car and maybe there's meaning on top of that but that's that should be connected to the experiences you have with it so maybe you think like it yet yeah, represents freedom and so I love looking at it but it's in part because it actually has to give you it gives you some freedom and that's, that's a legitimate kind of thing. So I think of, I don't think at all of quantity of, you know, how much stuff do I have? And that's not the first access that I'm looking on. I'm more looking at what are the experiences that I want to have and then what kinds of products or anything else that one could have, uh, do I, do I want? And so then I think, okay, well, like concretely, I'm thinking, okay, do I want a, uh, a Hobie paddle kayak? Like that's something I'm thinking of. I'm going to mm -hmm. try one out this, this weekend. And I don't know the answer to that cause I never did one, but it, it seems like it would fill a need, but 
do I really need to buy one? Or maybe it's the kind of thing I want to do twice a year and I can rent one. Mm -hmm. But if you think of it as, oh, well, is that too much to have or not? It's, it's the wrong question. It's just how can this contribute to my experience? Now, one thing that does contribute to experience negatively with this, this woozy category of having things is just people accumulate things that are a very little very at most very infrequent service and often of no service to them and then they accumulate and then that is very draining and so there's this kind of minimalism movement and and that has some legitimacy but it it's 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 the it's the wrong way to think of it to think of oh i just need less stuff because there could be something that you used all the time and that was beneficial, or it could be a picture of your kid that was always motivating. So it's, it's the physical thing is just the quantity of having a thing is not a good primary unit of measurement for anything. So the primary unit of measurement, or a primary unit of measurement would be better. One would be like my experience of life. And then I want to own things in relation to what's going to give me the best experience. And then that's going to change with other things, including uh, just as the economy changes. So I used to feel like I needed to own a car and, and now I don't. And I imagine in the future, a lot more people will feel like they don't need to uh, own a car, but when they did own a car, that was the right thing for them to have. And then if they don't, it's the right thing for them not to have. So, so much of, here's one thing about clear thinking, so much about clear thinking is this issue of standard of value. So when I'm saying X is good, X is bad, did I pick the right yardstick, the right unit of measurement? And people are constantly picking the wrong units of measurement. And in, in, with anything involving environmental issues, people are always focused on what they call environmental impact, which is how much are we impacting the planet around us? And I just think, well, okay, this could, if, if you say, well, environmental impact could mean like a toxic waste spill or it could mean I'm building a hospital for children with cancer, right? Both of those are big environmental impacts. So that's a, that's a whole, Ayn Rand would call this classification by non-essentials. You're, you're packaging, or should sometimes call it package dealing. And you're, you're packaging together things that don't belong together. So the ultimate way that I package things is I like having categories that are either consistently for human flourishing or consistently against it. So with things like how much I have, that's neither consistently for nor consistently against. So what people say is, sophisticated people say, oh, well, you know, you have to strike a balance. But it, no, that's wrong too. That's not sophisticated because how do you decide how to strike the balance? The only way is if you had a standard. But if you have a standard, why don't you formulate your principles clearly this is the whole, I mean, the whole issue of selfishness is, is a whole one too, where um, people talk about, oh, well, selfishness, or they, they mostly write out, write off selfishness as bad, but, uh, which I don't at all, but I, but they, they, they'll combine, you know, um, me, you know, like, okay, it's selfish. Hey, I, I invited you to my house cause I thought we'd have an interesting podcast versus like, uh, I kidnapped you to take your car, right? Both of those are, are selfish. And the idea is, well, sort of, but no, that's not quite the right thing. And so, so you're, you're, if you blend those together, then, then you ask, well, should the next thing be selfish? Well, I don't know. It depends. Is it going to be another kidnapping or another podcast? So th this, is, this is a huge thing that I got from Ayn Rand is this idea of classifying by essentials, that when, when we have the concepts that we use, including the concepts of action, should they should always serve a purpose. And I believe the purpose should be some form of what I'll call human flourishing. And so you always want to think about when I'm when I'm lumping things together, do they really go together? And I would say that in the realm of ethics, most things that people most concepts that people use are illegitimate and very confusing. And then they say, oh, you have to balance these confusing things. But really, no, you should have a clear standard and then you shouldn't use these really bad concepts. What are you shocked that humans aren't better at? Well, I, I try not to be for any length of time because what is, I mean, how much sense would that make yeah. to be indefinitely shocked? At, Maybe just at very something. surprise is a better way to, to posture the question. Yeah, but it's it's an interesting thing because I do experience. I, I, mean, I, th I think maybe I think of it as. My, 
there's this idea that I keep mentioning Ayn Rand, which is not a coincidence. I, I love Ayn Rand. And um, the she had this expression, it's earlier than you think. And I, I, I don't actually think in those terms much. I, that expression doesn't occur to me all the time, but but I think that way a lot, where it's just human beings are in an earlier stage than we think. And I, I find this actually quite helpful for myself in that I think, no, I hope at least that, oh, you know, in 10,000 years, people will know more about how to treat a kid than people knew when I was growing up. I mean, even even something like bullying, which has now been a kind of, which, which is now a, a cause for people. And I think mostly, that's mostly a good thing that it's a cause. You know, I just, I mean, at certain points in my life, I bullied people. I was certainly bullied uh, quite a bit. And there's no way that that environment that I grew, I mean, just even leaving aside, you know, home and stuff like that. I just mean even just the social environment like that. There's no way that was optimal in any way, shape or form, psychologically, educationally. So I just think, so that's helpful when I think of now, like, why, why am I this way? Why does this bother me? You know, part of it is, it's not to make excuses, but it's just to say, well, do you expect that given where you grew up, that you're going to have had everything figured out by pick the age, you know, by 22 or 24 or something like it's, we start out ignorant anyway. So it's really, a lot of these things are hard and it can, it's hard to know how this human being should function. So it's, it's, I, I try to think of it as, um, it's important just as I would have sympathy for a kid who didn't know any better. I sometimes think, okay, well, I can't expect that I'll know everything about life before I've experienced life. And so I can try for my own kids to give them more, but even they're going to have something that's, I hope, woefully inadequate by the standards of 2,000 uh, years uh, years from now. So, so from that perspective, I can bring up examples like, well, why do we... Why do we eat so badly? It's just like, why why can't we get our act together at all? I mean, there's this question of it's really hard to figure out what's true in that. But even even there, okay, people have some idea. Uh, Most people know the best practices. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't agree with that. But but you think like there's, there's something like most of what I'm consuming at this buffet is probably not slimming, <laughs> right? There There's... <laughs> There's there's something, but so that's kind of shocking. But then you have to ask, well, why is that? It's so a part of it might be, well, there's not clarity about what to do, and when you lack that kind of clear direction, then it's a lot easier to be pulled into other things. But there are other things, including like just what's going on psychologically, and I don't know. The point is just that I try to, when I see something that's shocking, I try never to take it as oh, well, I just lost, conf like, I'm now cynical about the human species. And it, the human species is not living up to my standards. In a sense, that's true, but I think of it more as I want to give, if I have a standard, I want to make sure, I want to use it for myself first and foremost, but then I want to I want to articulate it and explain it to people in a way where they're motivated to follow it. But I think it's very, there's a dangerous tendency with people who talk about ethics to be misanthropic in the sense that they think like, well, I have this vision for the world and the world is not living up to my vision. And so I'm going to be angry at the world. And there's something very off. And, and, and then they have like a moral evaluation of sort of the sum total of all human choices in history. And, and I, I don't think that's a way to enjoy oneself and I don't think it's objective. So I, I tend to think of it in terms of it's earlier than you think. There's just so much that's hard to know and to figure out. And when there's so much of that ignorance, uh, it makes a lot of things hard, including it makes it hard for people to even know how to eat and particularly how to know how to eat in a society where there's unlimited donuts mm -hmm. around them. Yeah, that that begs a, a parallel question. When you, you know, food, I think food's a really good example because whether we have perfect clarity on what best practices are or not, I, I think the way you're describing it is, um, you know, there's an understanding piece and there's a discipline piece. You know, when you take it outside of food to, um, I don't know, I, I hate to keep going back to fossil fuels or human flourishing, but that's, that's what you're the expert on. Uh, you know, do you see something like human flourishing being the same way? Is it, is it more a function of a lack of understanding or a lack of discipline? Well, 
one thing that I get from people all the time is they'll just say, wow, that's a great concept. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard that concept. And that captures, that captures a lot of what I want in life. And it's, it's so interesting that think how primitive is our educational system and our ethics that people don't even talk about human flourishing. And it's a big deal that I even talk about it. And I, I, I trace this to, I mean, I think that these are some of my more controversial views, but just, I think that people equate, um, I think they equate ethics with self-sacrifice and, and I mean, more fundamentally, there's no, there's been kind of, I, I was going to use the word shockingly, mm -hmm. but it's kind of shockingly little exploration of human flourishing. And that's a really interesting thing. Like, why isn't there more interest in this, in this subject? I think a lot of it is that, uh, people's conception of thinking about ethics is that you shouldn't be thinking about flourishing, certainly not your own flourishing. You should think about um, others, but it's others in the sense of, of sacrifice, in the sense of like your life isn't important. You should sacrifice to others. And if that's really like, cause if you really care about others flourishing in, in a full sense, it's completely incoherent not to care about yourself flourishing. And if you, if you don't care about yourself flourishing and you don't care about others flourishing, that's really dangerous because then you're just going to do a whole bunch of things and say, oh, it's not for me, but it's, it's for everyone else's benefit. And that's ultimately what dictators uh, do. So I, I just think we're at, we're at a primitive state where people, um, their whole, so much of ethics is just based on self-sacrifice. And I believe it's just been proven, particularly in the last several hundred years, that human beings fundamentally don't need to live by sacrifice because we're creative beings. We're not predator. We don't need to live as predators uh, on one another because we can, we can create value. So in general, there's not a conflict among people's interests. There's, there's in a broad sense, a very deep harmony among people's interests. And it's possible for 8 billion people to be really prosperous. And I would be better off if people in Africa and different parts of Asia were really prosperous. There's not some finite limit on the amount of raw material that we can translate into resources. Uh, given the fact that, given the fact that abundance is possible, why are we still thinking in terms of to be good means for me to take a loss? Uh, and that is, and to talk about human flourishing means to say, well, I want to take a gain and I also am interested in other people, uh, gaining and that that would be a good focus for for people to have and that's part of the reason uh, for the show but if we're not even focused on human flourishing as as like a consistent thing then it's kind of no wonder that people have difficulty working it out just one other point is that so because i think of human flourishing and selfishness is very aligned and selfishness in the proper sense selfishness just means you benefit and what was I going to say about that? Um, unfortunately, that point about human flourishing and selfishness that seemed so important when it occurred to me, I forgot. So maybe maybe it'll come up well, uh, again. Too much time in a triangle choke there, Professor. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, well, yeah, he's got to explain. He called me Professor, which I, I decided when I was younger I was never going to be a professor. I would never go to graduate school. But yeah, in the context of uh, our jujitsu school, if you're a black belt, you get called a Professor. Uh, any more questions, Matt? Yeah. Um, what impresses you most about what humans have achieved? Well, I mean, you think about where we are today compared to 300 years ago, it's really, it kind of doesn't make sense to say I'm fortunate to be born now because like my genetic composition could only have occurred at a certain moment with my parents' genetic composition and whatnot. But if I could choose to be born any time, it would definitely be now compared to uh, before. And you just think about so I'm really in in my work on energy in particular. I'm just obsessed with this concept of human beings as intelligent transformers of nature. And you just think about okay, we're in a room right now, and it's not that exceptional a room, but it's got you just look at the materials in this room, and these materials make no sense 
in terms of the default composition of the planet. Like even, okay, there's a metal doorknob, like where the hell did that come from? Right. That wasn't, and then it's like, Oh, that was rust on a rock somewhere. Right. And then there's just this quilted blanket because we happen to be in a, in a guest room recording this. And then there's this box and you just try to think back 5,000, 10,000 years ago. And just think about if, if people just even saw these kind of raw physical objects, even leading, leaving aside electronics, it just make no sense mm -hmm. because nature did not give them to us. So we, we created it. And that doesn't mean we brought them from nothing. It means that we rearranged really the molecules in nature. So you just think about what the planet was like and then how we've rearranged these molecules and to the point where just we have screens, it just, it doesn't make any sense. So what human, I love magic. I love magic shows. And, but what human beings have done is just so far beyond magic. Like it makes, it makes no sense from the perspective of the, you know, the rest of nature, the, um, what human, what our ancestors could have any reason to expect. Like just, we can, you know, we can fly, but we fly in a totally different way than say birds fly. So I think if one is not just fundamentally impressed by what the other billions of people have done in the aggregate, then there's something really wrong. I mean, what else could you be uh, impressed by? So in that sense, it's it's just, no, I, I really believe that, I, I really love human beings as a species. And sometimes people will say, what's your spirit animal? And I'll say, well, it's, it's a human. Because <laughs> I like that animal. I just like it. I look at it from the, if I was on another planet, I'd be like, wow, those build the best nests, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and we have a whole philosophy today that says, well, if a human did it on the planet, it's bad. It wasn't green. And if another animal did it, it was fantastic, right? So beaver builds a dam. Oh, well, that's natural. Human beings build a skyscraper. Oh, that's unnatural. So we have this idea, we have this concept of natural that discriminates against human beings. And so my view is, oh, we're the best part of nature. And I, I think that in particular, our accomplishments in the material realm and then the thinking that went behind that, that's amazing. And I have a lot of alignment with Ayn Rand on you know, her view is that a lot of it is that, yeah, we, we did all of these amazing things in the material realm. And yet in the mental realm, we're still pretty primitive and we don't appreciate part of it is we don't appreciate what we've done in the material realm. And one sign of our depravity, the, the depravity, at least of a lot of our culture is that historically we've had so much contempt for the people who've mastered the material realm. Like we regard it as, Oh, they're just dollar, dollar chasers. They're profiteers. If you were really a good person, you just go in India, go to India, but not India now, like not growing India, like in India stagnating. And you would just sit with lepers and misery and that would be good. Mm -hmm. But if you built a skyscraper and made a fortune, that was bad. And she's like, wait, wait a second. What's your standard there? Because if your standard is human life, that was a really good thing to build the skyscrapers. And maybe we should admire them more. And maybe, maybe they, they didn't have quite the right mindset in doing it. Maybe they, maybe they, some of them might've been too focused on like gaining stuff as an end in itself. But, but there was something there where they saw the world and they saw you know what, like the world is a certain way and I have, I can imagine a better way and I can figure out a series of steps to like go from a patch of dirt on the ground to a skyscraper. And I think, oh, well, that is, that's like what the human being does. And yeah, I like a lot of other animals, but no other animal can build uh, a skyscraper. So I just, I'm fundamentally impressed by human beings and I really, I dislike it a lot when people use human as a negative adjective. Yeah. That's so interesting. Man. That, that was worth the price of the admission right there. Really <laughs> cool. Love, love hearing that. I just got one more if you got time. Okay. One more. Jiu-Jitsu related. Oh yeah. <laughs> what, uh, you know, having done combat with other humans for you know, decade plus now, how has jujitsu changed your way of thinking? I think or what major learning do you, have you had? Well, the word that always occurs to me when I think of jujitsu is microcosm. So, you know, m microcosm is like a, a shrinking down of a, of a world. So I think of it as a, so much of what I experience in jujitsu 
is applies to it not just applies to life but it 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 maps really well to life including issues of i mean certainly the importance of growth and and the enjoyability of growing my capabilities and and that jujitsu is fun when i'm growing my capabilities and it's it's not fun if it if i was just rolling against horrible white belts all the time and finishing them with guillotine chokes, yeah. you know, over and over and over, right? But some people live their lives like that. Nor is it fun, uh, certainly not for me, if I'm just out of shape and then getting smashed by world champion black belts and just like s- struggling. And that's another way that that people live their lives. And, and so I find that it, it it has a pretty good model for what, a good life is life, but it has a lot of challenges and there are a lot of, there's a lot of pitfalls that can easily make one deviate from the really enjoyable capability building uh, path of it, including psychological things, like even including, okay, I didn't, I didn't roll well today and wrestle well today. Like what's wrong with me? You know, oh, there's something wrong with me or like, well, shouldn't I be better at this after all these years? Like, oh, should I be, I mean, I've been doing this for so long. Like, why can't you beat this guy? Or th- there's, and thinking through a lot of the stuff that goes on in jujitsu, like thinking that stuff through, thinking through one's psycho- psychological issues in jujitsu, I-, I think will map very well to issues that one faces uh, in the rest of life. Now, sometimes now the thing is but it it, it it this is an issue of standard again and it's tricky because your standard in jiu-jitsu in a sense it could just be how many people do you beat in jiu-jitsu and as somebody who's not a good jiu-jitsu competitor it's easy for me to say oh it doesn't matter how many people you beat so i don't want to be one of those people but i i do want to say it is this is true of other realms too, where I've done better, where you, I'll give you an example of, of what I think is a, is a tragic case. So there's a guy named Margarita, who's actually, uh, Fernando Pontes He's famous actually for having some wars with our instructor, Flavio Almeida. And he had an interview that I read with him once. And I believe Margarita means cry baby. And he said, like, you know, he used to go to jujitsu, and, and I apologize if I'm butchering this a little bit, but this is pretty accurate. And he said, oh, I cry when I went there. And he just got this determination. And, and it was something like, oh, I'm not a crybaby anymore. And it's like, I'm going to beat every single person there. And he also ended, I, I can't I can't correlate this exactly, but he had a whole bunch of drug problems and other things like that. But there was just something about it where, like, yes, he won. And, and there was one year in particular where he won – the world championship in his weight class and he's only a medium sized guy and then he won the open class so it's an amazing achievement but it doesn't seem like he would be what i would call flourishing in jiu jitsu and so i'd think of it as it, it's great to win and and if you're a professional you need that to be a focus but in terms of if jiu jitsu is your life it better be something with, with where you're experiencing that enjoyment of growing your capabilities uh, a lot. So in that sense, that's a more human flourishing standard than just, I'm going to beat, uh, everyone who's in front of me, but it's not unrelated to beating people. So if you just feel like, oh, I'm growing all the time and I'm horrible at jujitsu, that's the thing too. And people do that in life too. Like, oh, I'm growing all the time. They're not good at anything, right? Nobody values anything there's something off there. So it's, it's why you always want to have the right standard and, and have an idea of, but, but not be delusional about it because when you talk about flourishing it's kind of some people can be delusional so you really have to be honest with yourself you need to think about okay well one thing if i'm flourishing is i should be creating value and if nobody is ever recognizing any value that i'm creating that there seems to be something uh, off with that so to to go back to myself then i think if i think of jujitsu as like yeah i want to experience it this way i learn so much in terms of the times when I don't pursue it that way and then I see the negative there and then when I do pursue it that way it's so enjoyable and then it's um just so many of the the in trying to pursue it that way I just make many little mistakes that I learn from but then that itself 
is a growth in the capability because it's because I can say, okay, well, like today I didn't love my mindset. And then I can look at that. Oh, what's wrong with me? I have a bad mindset, right? Or, oh, this is an opportunity to grow my mindset. And, and I find that if you can do that in a realm where like you're getting punished all the time by getting beaten up uh, and, and there is something like unpleasant about just getting about expecting to do a certain way and then just getting uh, then then losing. If you can, if if you can really, if you can flourish in jujitsu in the constructive way, that's a very good model for the rest of life. I think that sometimes people will act out their their lacking qualities in jujitsu, and that's a whole issue. And then sometimes people will win in jujitsu in some way, but then that's just that that that's just their own pathology, and. And that's a problem. But I know that when you're, I, I can see that when I look at the lectures that you give on Jesus and when you're talking to people, I remember the last one I heard you were talking about something about just the importance of enjoying that process. And, yeah. and, and that should be true of life. So if, if somebody is not ex- enjoying their experience of life, they feel like, oh, I'm being so successful this year. And you see this all the time, like, oh, I'm being so successful this year, but I'm miserable. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, well, what are you waiting for? That's right. Yeah, what that's, are you waiting for? Point. Very cool. Alex. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking the questions. I hope that the people enjoyed listening to it. If you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Also, you can post on the Facebook group at facebook.com slash human flourishing project. And to get on the mailing list, go to human flourishing project dot com next week i'll be back not sure what the topic is but it'll be about human flourishing until next time i'm alex epstein this has been the human flourishing project